Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Now, first of all, we would like you to just talk a little bit about um, what is the mission of Technion Technology Transfer, and can you give us kind of a brief overview of your operations? Well, the Technion uh, Technology Transfer is the tech transfer company of the Technion. So our role <coughs> is to make sure that innovations that are developed within the Technion finds their way to the marketplace. Um, in today's day and age, you know, it's very imperative, it's very important for university not just to do research, not just to do teaching, but to do technology transfer. And uh, at the Technion, we have come to realize that universities that will not be able to impact the marketplace by creating jobs, by engaging the community, by building companies, to some extent will become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And how does the technology transfer process at Technion work? I mean, how do you go about identifying research that has commercial potential, and then what are the stage, stages of actually turning that into a product or a service that people can buy on the market? Well, that's a very good question. The, the main mission, I think, the number one mission is to increase the level of openness of the institution to commercialization, because you have to understand that the ed at the end of the day, people come for a university like the Technion, which is you know, considered the, uh, the MIT, of, uh, of Israel, certainly, <coughs> if not the Middle East, uh, um, uh, they come to do, you know, cutting-edge research. And the Technion is considered among the top 10 universities in the world. So first of all, you, you need to increase the level of openness of the researchers to commercialization. So this is number one. Then, you know, the idea is how you bring the innovations that you produce to the marketplace. How do you increase the awareness and how do you create the opportunities for this innovations to find their way to the marketplace? Now, I mean, when you have several good ideas that could lead to commercial products, what process do you use, I mean, to kind of figure out, I mean, of all the wonderful research going on at the university, I mean, what kind of process do you go through to figure out, you know, what are the things that are maybe going to be most likely to sort of have that direct path to commercial research, or even maybe ones that are a little more of a twisting yeah. path, like what is sort of the right projects to focus right. on? Well, you know, you can tell a lot about a nation by looking at your culture heroes. You know, let's uh, let's take a quick look at the United States. Who are the culture heroes? So of course, you have Bill Gates and, you know, Steve Jobs and, and, and others, but you also have the Hollywood players and the politicians. In Israel, for many years, the culture heroes, so to speak, were the generals, you know, people like Moshe Dayan and Arik Sharon and others. But in recent years, you know, people like Gil Shved, people like Yossi Vardi, you know, the pioneers in the high-tech industry certainly became the new culture heroes of, of Israel. Now, many of them are graduates of the Technion. You may be surprised to learn that out of the 120 Israeli or Israeli-related companies on NASDAQ, 70% of the CEOs or COOs of these companies are graduates of the Technion. So our main focus in order to commercialize the technologies is finding the right person to take that technology to the market. So we have developed a very elaborate, you know, what we call EIR, Entrepreneur in Residence Program, whereby we try to marry a very strong entrepreneur with a very strong technology. And what we do is we use these entrepreneurs as agents of the marketplace within the campus of the Technion. And what have you found, I mean, with having the entrepreneurs working together with the researchers, what do you find that the two are able to learn from each other as they're kind of in this partnership? You know, this is a very interesting dialogue because, you know, at academic settings, many of the innovations are technologies looking for a problem. But you, if you have the qualified, you know, the trained eye of a very strong entrepreneur, out of this dialogue, you know, some, most, most, some of the most brilliant things can, can come out. And we have witnessed time and again. Mm -hmm. And now what do you find? I mean, do you find that also the researchers, are, I mean, the entrepreneurs are learning some things from the researchers as well? Always. Absolutely. And now one of the best known examples of tech transfer um, has been, at Technion, has been the development of a treatment for Parkinson's disease called Azalec. Correct. I'm pronouncing that right. Correct. And that was developed based on research at Technion by, again, hoping I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Musa Udim and John Finberg in collaboration with Teva Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Could you take us through the process of how that came about? Well, 
you know, first maybe we should step, take a you know a quick step uh, step back. In Israel, we have you know uh, maybe four leading universities: the Technion, certainly uh, <coughs> one of them, the Hebrew University, and the Weizmann Institute. All three leading universities in Israel, Technion, Hebrew Universities, and the Weizmann Institute, have at least one FDA-approved drug in the market, and the Technion is you know belongs to this quite distinguished club of universities that were able to develop a drug and take it to, uh, <clears throat> to the marketplace. Now, you have to remember, this is, the process started about 20, 25 years ago, when the funding from sources like the NIH and others were quite, quite, quite more available. So the research was done at the laboratory of Professor Musa Yudim and uh, John Feinberg, and later on it was licensed in a pure, straightforward licensing deal which as opposed to deals that are done today was about a four pages deal. And up until today, uh, you know, it serves us very well. Mm -hmm. Now, the, and this is, again, a good demonstration of how long it takes to develop the drug that, you know, is developed at the bench top in a university setting until it reaches the marketplace. And people don't always realize that this is a very long and tedious process. So when you ask me why isn't it happening, for example, through VCs, and why was it directly licensed to a, to a commercial company, then I would tell you that this is the right process for, for drug developments. Because be, between a university and the venture capital world, there's some sort of a synchronization problem. Because we operate in a window that could easily be 10, 11, 12 years long, and as we see here, even 20 while the VCs operate in a much shorter window of five, six, seven years. And this gap has to be filled. And the question is, who will fill the gap? And if it's not the government, it has to be industry. Otherwise, all this investment will be lost. Not the government, it has to be industry. Otherwise, all this investment will be lost. Mm -hmm. Now, could you give us some other more examples of research at Technion that was successfully turned into commercial products and maybe talk a little more about Absolutely. trying to figure out, you just mentioned sort of go through like a commercial company versus VCs, like some of the different paths maybe you've taken to try and get the, get the product to market? Absolutely. We are, you know, uh, although we are predominantly an engineering school, the Technion has made some major breakthroughs in, in medical devices. So in all the area of robotic-aided surgery, the, the Technion has won considerable fame. Some of the companies that we uh, boast in are companies like Mazol, which is in the business of spine fusion. About 3% of the procedures that are done today, when you do spine fusion, the doctor drills right into the spine cord. What Mazol allows using a robotic-aided surgery is first to see and then only to do the drill. This is a company by Professor Moshe Shoam. Another company that we started with Professor Moshe Shoam is a company called Corindus. Corindus is in the business of remote catheterization. I have a brother, he's an interventional cardiologist in uh, Mount Sinai in New York, and he walks a little bit bent. And this is because of the heavy lead suits that they need to wear while operating. So imagine for a minute that you sit in a remote location, it can be the adjacent room or it can be the, the other, another continent, and using joystick, you guide the guide, wider, the guide wire in the body of the patients and do the procedure remotely. And this is what is done by a company like Corindus. Mm -hmm. Now, Technion companies have raised, just in year 2012, close to $60 million. In years 2011, it was, again, close to $50 million. In the last three years, they have raised close to $150 million, which in Israeli terms is quite significant. Mm -hmm. And this is a demonstration of the validation of the marketplace, of industry, in the innovation that is coming out of the technia. Mm -hmm. Now, often, I mean, when you're talking about innovation or really anything, I mean, you often have for every one success, there's probably, you know, multiple failure, failures you can talk about. And sometimes you learn more from those than maybe some of the successes. So could you talk about maybe what are some of what have been some of Technion's most instructive failures and what you've learned from them? Well, at the end of the day, what we have learned that the level of risk at which we are talking is extremely, extremely high but the, because the level of unknowns on the technology level on the marketing level 
is extremely high. And this is why, and this is what, something that we have learned, that in order to successful, successfully launch uh, an enterprise, a company, you need a very, very strong entrepreneur. We see starting a business as sending a spacecraft to space. The first 10 minutes that you detach yourself from gravity, consume 80, 90% of the energy of the gasoline in, in, in this huge spacecraft, and you have to have the person, the right person, to inject the energy into the process, and this person is the entrepreneur. Now, many think that because it's a university and a, you know, a high-risk technology, you can, so to speak, do well with a less experienced entrepreneur, but it's right on the contrary. To commercialize a technology from a university, you need a very strong entrepreneur that can you know, relay to the marketplace raise the necessary capital, but at the same time, talk at the eye level with a professor. So if you ask me what is the number one lesson, is have a very, very strong team that knows how to work together. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you say um, Technion's technology transfer operation and the way that you go about doing this compares with other Israeli institutions such as the Weizmann Institute and then also U.S. institutions like M MIT or Stanford or even here at Wharton? Well, this is, again, an, an excellent question because, you know, this is part of the metrics that we use to measure ourselves, to ask ourselves, are we successful? So first of all, let's, you know, compare apples to apples. You know, take the research budget. The research budget of, M of the Technion is something like $70 million. The research budget of a university like MIT, including Lincoln Lab, is $1.4 billion. The research budget of Stanford is $700 million. So if you just use the income metrics compared to the investment that you make in research, the Technion is doing extremely well because we generate today close to $25 million directly from commercialization. So this is either royalties, income, equity, or dividend. Now, if you compare it to what MIT is doing and other leading university, we are doing extremely well. But the point is that as a university, this is not the only metrics that you should use. I mean, for us, the income certainly is critical, but you need to see the economic development that is done around the Technion. In a city like Haifa, how many companies have established their presence surrounding the Technion in order to tap into the human capital and the resources available at the Technion? Mm -hmm. So companies like Google, uh, Philips, Microsoft, all have and are operating significant R&D centers at a 10 minutes drive from the Technion campus. So it's not just how much, but it's more like what kind of domino effect does each one create? Like this goes to this and this. Uh, you are absolutely right, Rachel. Again, the issue is not to maximize every deal that we do. So we do not try to extract the most economic value from the deals that we do, but we try to do as many deals as possible. In a way, we view technology transfer as a lottery business because, honestly, you never really know which technology will actually make the difference, be the, par the paradigm shift. So you try to buy as many tickets as possible. And if you ask me what is the philosophy that makes T3, my unit, unique, is that we have adopted a philosophy that if Technion is a huge harbor, we are the tag boat. Our role is to make sure that the research done at the Technion will find its way out of the port of the Technion as quickly and as effectively as possible. We are not a gateway. And this is something that is changing, and I think it's very important for the industry to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, what are some of your top priorities for 2013, and then also kind of looking beyond that a little bit? Well, we are putting a huge emphasis now on stem cells. Just a couple of months ago, we have started a company called Axelta within Amit, which is an internal incubator that we started with the help of uh, Alfred Mann, you know, a uh, very prominent and successful businessman here in the United States that have started many companies. And Axelta is exactly in the business of drug development, drug screening. We all realize now that the drug development and the drug screening is broken. So what Axelta is doing at the end of the day, it will be to help do clinical trials on a chip, as opposed you know, to the way clinical trials are done today. 
It's a stem cells company developing the pick and shovels of the industry of the stem cells, uh, uh, stem cells research and stem cells uh, development. Ben, thank you so much for talking with us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you.